So the Local Catch Network is a community of practice, which it seems like many of you are already members of the Local Catch Network. Uh, we are made up of seafood harvesters, technical assistance providers, organizers, and researchers from across North America and now Mexico. Um, and we are all committed to strengthening local and regional seafood systems through community support of fisheries and direct seafood marketing. We have about 500 people in our network um, and I would have to say a lot of people are very enthusiastic about the work that they do and Find Your Seafood Week is just a great opportunity um, to be able to share some of the work that you all are participating in. Um, and so I will tell you a little bit more about Find Your Seafood Week. So this is the second year we're gonna be hosting Find Your Seafood Week. Um, originally we had kicked it off last year in 2021 um, and we had just launched a new seafood finder um, and wanted to bring attention to that as well as provide opportunities for people who are a part of the network to again amplify the work that they're doing in their communities um, across North America. And so last year we had a really great response from the people who participated in the campaign. We had about 40 Local Catch Network members, um, partnering organizations, et cetera, um, who participated in the campaign. Um, and we ended up reaching close to, uh, or over 200 million people through that campaign. And so there was a lot of awesome exposure from people participating. Um, media had picked up some of the campaign. We had um, some exposure through Good Morning America and a few other press releases and, and outlets. Um, but really it was also another great way for other members of the network to, again, share their stories and learn from one another and figure out like, what, is, what are these other people doing um, and really get inspiration from one another. Um, so we're super excited to be hosting a second year of Find Your Seafood Week. And um, I would say that, um, the campaign is really driven by the people who participate in it. And so the more people that are participating, the more visibility the sector as a whole is receiving, and then the more that you all can uplift one another. So I'll leave it at that, and I will pass it over to Emily to introduce herself and uh, kind of give us a run of show for the day. Perfect. Thank you, Jordan. Um, so my name is Emily, and I'm going to be um, hosting the rest of our conversation today, um, hopefully providing some insights and strategies to help you all during Find Your Seafood Week. So I'm a trained fishery scientist. I study at the University of Guelph, um, and I'm working now as a science communicator. I run my own business called Seaside with Emily. Um, so you might have like seen me on social media. I know I see some familiar faces here in uh, in the on the Zoom call, which is nice to see. Um, so a lot of what I do is explaining the science of sustainable seafood to the average consumer online in ways that are fun and easy to understand, um, and then also showcasing a lot of innovative seafood operations around the world. So um, I have a variety of different relationships with the Local Catch Network, I guess, just in case you're wondering how I ended up here. Um, so my master's research was actually um, done in partnership with the local catch network. So a lot of um, a lot of the members were actually hugely instrumental in helping me with my research, focusing on the local catch core values. I also did a lot of work with the network throughout the pandemic. Um, so we actually wrote a paper um, that was co-authored by a lot of the network members. We wrote a few op-eds with myself, Josh, um, and other members of my advisory committee. And then, of course, we also had the Social Fish Sensing podcast, uh, which was a podcast that we did in partnership with the network, essentially speaking to you guys every single week for the first year of the pandemic to figure out uh, what was going on and how community supported fisheries were responding. So um, I've always felt very fortunate to have been able to work with the network. Um, CSFs were completely new to me three years ago, um, and I'm so glad that I stumbled upon uh, this in my advisory committee and was introduced to the network because I think that the work Work that local catch is doing is so important and so i'm so excited to have the opportunity um, to work with local catch again for this program um also i have two laptop screens going so if i'm like looking off camera that's why i promise i'm not checking emails off to the side or anything 
So in this webinar, I'm going to be sharing some social media and digital marketing strategies to help um, you guys maximize your impact during Find Your Seafood Week. So I'm going to first start by talking a little bit about why it's important to get online, why social media matters to seafood businesses like yours. We're going to talk really briefly about the Find Your Seafood Week toolkit. And then we're going to get into some best practices for social media, um, go over some reels. I saw somebody mention reels in the chat. I'm so glad that someone did because video content is hugely important on social media these days. And then we're going to talk about how to effectively tell your story online. So let's start with why get online. I know that getting on social media can be super daunting and it can also be very time consuming, um, but having a social media presence is so important, especially today. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys all know, I'm sure even yourselves, you're on social media a lot of the times. People are seemingly attached to their phones these days. You know, we check Twitter, we always have notifications on, we're always scrolling through something. Um, so having a social media presence is super important for that. Um, it's also becoming increasingly more important because the average seafood consumer is changing. Um, so I've been, you know, knee deep in a lot of consumer research over the last few years. And what we're noticing is this growing demographic of seafood consumers. And that growing demographic is young people. So millennials and Gen Z, so sort of like the below 40 years old kind of range, uh, those people are making up the largest, the fastest growing seafood, the fastest growing demographic of seafood consumer in the world. And these people also happen to be the ones who are on social media the most. I mean, Gen Z is pretty much the TikTok generation. Um, so this, this age group of young people is very tech savvy and convenience minded. But they're also very environmentally conscious when it comes to their purchasing decisions, whether it's food or anything else. Um, one of the number one things that millennials are considering when making purchasing decisions is, you know, the sustainability, the environmental impact and the social impact, um, which is one of the reasons why I think it's so important for local catch members to get online, because I know that a lot of the core values of the network are perfectly aligned with the core values of young people. They just need to know that. And so just some stats here specifically about TikTok. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with TikTok. Um, I know a lot of people have a love-hate relationship with TikTok, Instagram, and all social media. Um, and I know that social media can get a bad rap for being, you know, all about selfies or silly dance videos. But the reality is, is that today people are continuously turning more and more to social media as a source of information. There is over 1 billion people on TikTok and almost half of them make up this 20 to 40 year old demographic, which, like I said earlier, is the fastest growing demographic of seafood consumers. And people are turning to these social platforms for information about, you know, their food, where they buy their food, how their food is produced, recipes, what do they do with their food when they get at home. And so having a presence on these platforms is hugely important so that they can easily access information and access it right from, you know, right from you guys, right from a credible source. So we've put together a Find Your Seafood Week toolkit. So myself, Jordan, and Paloma have been working on this over the last few weeks. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. This toolkit basically provides hopefully everything that you'll need um, to maximize your social media presence during the week. So there are, um, there are templates in there for customizing social media graphics, sp specifically for like Instagram in-feed posts, Instagram stories. There's also some banners so you can swap out your Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter headers. Um, there's some press releases and even some sample social media captions. And then there's also a Google Sheet uh, that acts as a content planner. So you can plan your content in advance, which I highly recommend doing. Um, I won't go too much further into this because we did film a, a Loom training video, which you hopefully have access to. Um, so if you want a little bit more of a walkthrough on how to actually use the tools in the toolkit, um, I highly recommend watching that video. It'll literally give you like a step-by-step -step, um, on what's in the toolkit and how to use it effectively. All right, now let's get to the good stuff. So I want to share six tips for maximizing your impact on social media. So these are things that I have learned over the last seven years of working online as a content creator, um, and specifically things that, again, I've learned as being a seafood content creator um, and working in the seafood industry as a digital marketer. So the first tip is to be authentic. Uh, social media is about 
being social. Uh, so people were people are on social media to connect with other people. You know, they don't want to connect with businesses. They don't want to feel like they're being sold a product. Um, and these days, consumers are very smart. Um, they can't be fooled very easily when it comes to things on social media, you know, things like content marketing. They're very aware of when things are, you know, brand partnerships, when things are just being posted because they're an ad. Um, social media has now been around for a very long time and consumers are really adept to it. And so what they want to do is they want to connect with real people. Um, this is how people are connecting nowadays. You know, we're not really going out in person so often. <laughs> this is how it happens. Um, but that's why it's so important to be authentic and actually get your face and yourself on social media. And again, I know it can be super daunting to actually hop in front of the camera and put yourself out there. Um, but research has shown that it's actually much more effective if you have people in your content, uh, whether that's, you know, a selfie photograph or if it's you actually speaking in front of a video. Content that has somebody's face in it gets 38% more engagement than photos that don't have people in them. And so this is just a really simple swap. I like to start with this one because it's super quick. You can, you know, make this adjustment really easily. It doesn't require a mass overhaul of your social media, uh, but just trying to get yourself, maybe other people in your business involved in it, maybe your customers who feel comfortable sharing a story. Um, getting your face in there is really important. I've put up here two screen grabs from two separate Instagram accounts. It's a bit biased because one of them is my Instagram account. Um, but as you can see, my feed mostly contains photographs that contain myself or my face in them. Whereas this Instagram feed on the left, it looks very beautiful. It has a lot of nice, you know, imagery. There's clearly photographs that have been shot professionally and probably styled by a food stylist. Um, but there's nothing here that I'm connecting with. All I see is food that, you know, I will never be able to replicate. My food never looks that nice when I make it. Um, there's no like incentive for me to follow this. I don't feel like I'm connecting. Whereas with my content over here, there's a real person involved. It's much easier for people to connect with somebody's personality and want to follow them and their content. The next tip is to be quick. Uh, so while young people are very tech savvy and we're opening, we're open to marketing on social media, we are also known for having short attention spans. I think anybody on social media, anybody who has an Instagram or TikTok account can attest to this. You know, if something doesn't catch your attention within the first second, we're scrolling right by. Um, and this has also been confirmed by research. So you have less than two seconds to catch somebody's attention on social media. Um, so if your video or your photo doesn't catch somebody's attention in the first two seconds, they're going to scroll by. And you've got about 12 seconds, if you can stop the scroll, um, to tell them what they need to know. And so what I always encourage people to do in order to stop the scroll and get people's attention really quickly is to start your video with a hook, um, like a bold statement, something really exciting. You know, here's how you can save X amount on your grocery bill by buying seafood with us or whatever it might be. Something that will just get people's attention really quickly. Um, so normally when people make a video, they have all these like steps or all these stories that they want to tell before they get to the end, which is sort of their hook or their main message. So my like what I want to encourage you guys to do is to flip it around. So put your hook at the very beginning, get their attention within the two seconds, and then tell the story. Then unravel it, how they're going to get whatever that, whatever that key message is that you started with at the front. Now, the third tip is to be clear. And what I mean by this is having a clear call to action in your content. So tell your followers exactly what you want them to do with the content that you're sharing. And so what I mean by this is, you know, if you're posting content about your business um, or about Find Your Seafood Week, tell people what you want to do, what you want them to do with that information. So if you're posting about Find Your Seafood Week and how great it is that we have all these community based fisheries and how great the local catch network is and we're raising awareness about local seafood, what are they supposed to do with that information? If the, if the call to action is to go check out the local catch seafood finder and find a local, you know, seafood business near you, make sure that's clear in the caption. Um, so people are 83% more likely to complete a call to action if you clearly communicate it to them. So I always like to say that communicating effectively on social media is a lot like talking to a six-year-old. So, I mean, we've already gone through those first couple tips to, you know, be quick, get their attention really quickly. If you don't catch a six-year-old's attention really quickly, they're going to move on to the next crazy thing that they're doing. They're going to lose interest in you. Um, and if you're not, if you're not uh, clear in what you want them to do, then again, they're not going to do anything. You need to tell them exactly what you want them to do with this piece of content. 
The next tip is to be fun. Um, so again, I've said it a million times. I know social media can be super daunting and overwhelming, but it can also be really fun. And I think being fun is really helpful to letting that authenticity show through. Um, it a, goes a long way to making social media less daunting and feel like less of a chore. Um, so don't be afraid to get creative and let your personality shine through. I know that everybody probably has or maybe you don't, but I know a lot of people have brand guidelines or, you know, certain lines of messaging that they want to stick to and things like that. But don't be afraid to draw color outside the lines or get outside the box. People on social media really like that. And it's been proven to be really effective. And I think that no brand does this better than Duolingo on TikTok. Um, if you have not seen Duolingo's TikToks, I highly recommend that you do it. Um, so Duolingo is a language learning app. Um, and they have this mascot here who he is, he or she, this mascot is basically the one who is the star of all their TikTok videos. Um, and the brand has been really effective at jumping on TikTok trends and using humor and making their videos really funny that people are always thinking about Duolingo or always talking about Duolingo. Um, it's always at top of mind because their videos are so effective in generating humor on social media. They've generated over 4 million followers in just two years, mostly from making hilarious videos like this. And then to give you a few examples of how that could translate into seafood, if you're thinking about how do I incorporate humor into my seafood content, these are examples of how I've done it in the past. Um, so, I mean, you can be the judge of how funny or not these are, um, but incorporating pop culture memes, things like this, um, trending memes like this one was from the Oscars and was really popular going around. Um, leveraging moments like that can be really effective to engage with your audience. Again, connecting with them on a more personal level. Maybe they're not seafood consumers just yet. Maybe they're a new follower. Connecting with them over something like a shared interest in Star Wars or the Oscars is a great way to, again, make that personal and authentic connection right off the bat. Now, the fifth tip is to share your why. And this is where I want to get a little bit into the storytelling aspect um, that I mentioned right at the beginning. So there's a common saying in marketing that people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Um, and so I really want to emphasize the why piece, not because I think that anybody in this network needs to be told to find their why, because I, I really think that anybody who's part of the local catch network already has a really strong why, already has really strong values. Um, of course, you know, like exemplifying the local catch core values. So I know that everybody has a really great why for doing what they do. It's just important that we get out there and share it because like I said, people don't buy what you do. They want to know why you do it and they want to connect with why you do it. And so one of the reasons that why is so important is, again, building that personal and authentic connection. We've seen through things like climate change and most recently the pandemic that people don't act based on facts. So we can sit here until we're blue in the face and we can talk about, you know, fisheries sustainability and we can talk about seafood sustainability and the health benefits of seafood and we can you know rhyme off numbers and facts but none of that is going to change anybody's behavior people are motivated by values why is this important to them why should they care why are the health benefits of seafood relevant to them oh because they have young kids and you also have young kids and that's part of the reason why you started the seafood business to make healthy sustainable protein more accessible for your children there's a common thread, your why, their why. It builds that personal and authentic connection. So this is um, an example of a formula that you can use to tell your why. So this is from Simon Sinek, who's like the master of all things why. Um, he has, uh, I think it's, I think his book is called Finding Your Why. He does a lot of like TED Talks and whatnot all about this um, with prominent business individuals and what not talking about why finding your why is so important. And so what he emphasizes is that, you know, every business is so good at explaining what they do. I mean, everybody knows what they do. That's sort of like the basic, the basic principle in business. At least you should know what service you're offering your customers or what you can provide them. Most of the time, I think, you know, how you do that. Um, but fewer, fewer and fewer people get to the heart of their business, which is why they do what they do. Um, and like it says here, it's not about making the money. There is a result, there's a purpose. There's a reason, there's a deeper reason that you do what you do. And like I said, 
I know that the people who are part of the local catch network have a really strong why. Um, that's, I think, part of the reason why local catch has these core values. And so I know that everybody has a great why. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that it's really important that you get out there and share that story because I know everybody has a great story to tell. And so the last tip that I want to share is to engage with your audience. So again, I've emphasized several times about building that personal and authentic connection. And that means that you're having a two-way conversation. So I want to encourage you not to just speak at your audience. Don't just, don't just post content and then never respond to any comments or feedback or questions. There should really be a dynamic conversation. There's two people here. You're posting content uh, for somebody, you're posting content for somebody to basically digest and engage with, and they're going to have questions or they're going to have thoughts. Um, so I encourage you to provoke them, to ask them. Um, when I spoke about a clear call to action, one of those, call, you can have a call to action that is, you know, something that they actually go do, whether that's check out your website or follow you on social media or go check out the local catch seafood finder. Another call to action that you can have is asking a question. So I do this a lot in my content where I will post um, a video or a photo, you know, I'll write out a short caption and then I'll ask my audience, you know, what do you think about this? What's your favorite seafood? You know, have you been to, you know, this is my favorite seafood destination. Have you been here? If not, what's your favorite seafood destination? Um, and encourage your audience to actually respond down in the comments. And then when they comment, respond back to them. Um, so again, encourage that conversation. It builds that more personal connection with your audience. It also helps your content a lot in the algorithm for getting bumped up a little bit more so it's a win-win and then the other thing you can do with your audience is actually ask them what they want to know so i mentioned that in the toolkit we have a content planner to help you plan out your content for the week so if you're looking at that and you're thinking what the heck am i going to post all week i can't think of seven post ideas or anything like that ask your audience it's the first place that i always go um, whenever i have you know a creative block or I'm unsure about the direction that my content is going in, I always just hop on social media and I ask them what they want to see. So Instagram, for I use Instagram as an example um, because that's the one that I'm most active on. But Instagram has a variety of different stickers, they're called, that you can use in your stories, so things like polls and questions. Um, and so you can put up a poll or you can put up a question and ask your audience, you know, what type of content do you want to see? Did you like X content? Do you want to see more of X or would you rather see Y? Um, again, doing this just helps to build a more personal connection with your audience. You're having that dynamic conversation. It also helps you in the algorithm again. Um, but more importantly, it's just easier for you. Um, then you don't have to start from scratch. If you ask your audience what they want to see, then they're actually building your content plan for you. Um, and you can basically just take their feedback and use it to build out your content plan for Find Your Seafood Week. Okay, now I want to share some tips for reels. Um, so I know somebody mentioned this in the chat. Um, and the simple fact of the matter is that video content is king on social media now. And I, I struggle with video content. I'll be the first one to admit that. Um, I begrudgingly joined TikTok um, during the pandemic. And now I have just been, you know, trying to post more consistently on there because video is really king on social media. It's the most effective at reaching people. It gets the highest engagement. Even platforms like Instagram are starting to push um, video content over photo content. Instagram had like a big update and a big press release a few weeks ago uh, where they actually, you know, announced this, that they were prioritizing video content on their platform. So if you're not already doing video content, this Find Your Seafood Week would be a great time to start with it. Um, and the good news is, is that it doesn't need to be super scary or overwhelming or time consuming. The good thing about video content becoming more popular today is that the type of video content that's becoming more popular is more raw, unfiltered video content. So 10 years ago, YouTube was the big thing and everybody wanted, you know, very high quality, very well shot cinematic YouTube video content that was lengthy. It was very professional and it, you know, you really needed to know what you were doing to create that type of content. These days, that's not the type of video content that's popular. The type of video content that's popular is you picking up your cell phone and 
talking to it and walking around, showing people around your boat, showing people, you know, how you fly fish at home, just propping it up, not even on a tripod, propping it up on a stack of cookbooks and showing people how you season your salmon for dinner. And that type of content is what people want to see. They want to see more raw, unfiltered, uncut footage that again, builds that personal connection because people can say, oh, you know what? Like my life looks like this. Her life isn't looking so cinematic. It's not shot in 4K. Um, she has, she says, um, in her video, you know, the camera's a bit shaky. And that's the type of video contents that people want. And again, keeping in mind the other tips at the beginning, they also want very quick video content. So I think the real length on Instagram now is about 90 seconds. I recommend trying to keep it under a minute. I usually aim for the 30 second mark, um, again, to hook them, get that information out there and then have a call to action. If you are gonna film some reels or TikTok videos, I just have a few um, tips here in terms of like actual filming. So the first one is to have good audio and good lighting. Um, I'm sure we've all opened up a video at one point or another and we've had horrendous sound coming out of it that has just made you cringe and wanna throw your phone out the window. Um, I see this a lot with people who like have their, are filming videos like on a boat or something and the wind is whipping by. It's not I like I can I'm cringing just like picturing the sound or listening to the sound in my head of what it sounds like for wind to be whipping on an iPhone. It's not a pleasant sound. Um, so if you are going to film videos like that, if you're out on the boat and you want to film videos outside and it is a bit windy, I recommend um, filming the video and then just stripping the sound from it. And then you can put a song over top of it, um, or you can even film a voiceover, which is actually what I would recommend, is just stripping the sound and filming a voiceover where you actually describe what's happening in the video. Lighting is another big one. Um, having good lighting is key. I'm sitting in front of a window. That's usually how I film my videos if I'm sitting in my office, um, or I have like ring lights that I'll set up. Again, you don't need any sort of like fancy setup. My ring lights are literally from Amazon. Um, they cost like less than $20, um, but natural lighting is the best. So if you can film outside, I would highly recommend that or even just like sitting in front of a window. Um, the second tip here is to use on-screen text and captions. So I know I just went on and on about good audio, um, but the reality is, is that to totally contradict what I just said, a lot of people listen or watch videos without audio rather. And so having on-screen text or captions is huge. Um, I mean, I'm sure most of us have been guilty of sitting in a Zoom meeting and actually looking at our phone. Um, and of course, watching it without sound so our bosses don't know that we're actually on TikTok. Um, and so having on-screen text and captions is helpful so that people who are watching without audio still know what's going on in the video. And then the third tip is to provide value or inspiration. So with every piece of content, as you're going through your content planner and you're planning for Find Your Seafood Week, I really want to encourage you to think about what's the goal of this content? Why am I posting this? Um, this is, I think, how you'll how you'll figure out what's relevant to your audience, how you'll make the biggest impact. Um, it's something that I've been more conscious of in my own content. Every time I'm, you know, putting together a video, I'm thinking about, okay, what do I want my audience to get out of this? Is it that I want them to learn a new skill in the in the kitchen? Do I want them to you know, connect with a local seafood business, or do I want to inspire them to go out and try a new recipe? Um, I just encourage you as you're putting together your content to think about why you're posting that piece of content, what the value is, or what the inspiration is, sort of what the end goal that you want your audience to take away from it. And then just to wrap up before, um, I wanted to leave some time for questions, but I just have a couple of reminders. So the first one is that in our toolkit, we have this graphic that you can edit in Canva and it's about climate resilient fisheries. Um, so part of the reason that I'm able to work with local catch during this Find Your Seafood Week is through some grant funding. Um, and one of the things that the grant funders are hoping to address through some of the projects that they're funding um, is how US fisheries are responding to climate change. Um, and so I know, you know, Jordan and Paloma and I talked about this and we thought this also would be really interesting um, just to chat a little bit more about how local catch members are responding to climate change and how they're being more climate resilient. Um, so if you have any, you know, plans in your business about climate change or how you're responding or innovative things that you're doing to be more resilient, um, I encourage you to use this graphic and share it. Um, it would be, I think, yeah, a really good just conversation prompt. And like I said, probably make the funders very happy. So I would appreciate that as well. And then the last thing that I just wanted to offer um, as more personalized feedback for Find Your Seafood Week um, is I, I'm going to 
put it out there to anybody who would like it, um, that if you would like more personalized feedback on your content plan, on any of the graphics that you design in Canva, or if you just have questions, um, from now until next Tuesday, so August 16th, if you send me anything to review, um, I will review it and then I will make a five minute Loom video similar to the one that I have in the toolkit um, where I will provide you feedback. Um, and I just wanted to offer this as an opportunity to get some more personalized feedback. I know this presentation was quite quick um, and a little bit high level. So if you have more specific questions um, or you're starting to build out your content planner and you get stuck on anything or you just want some feedback on how your Canva graphics are looking. If you send them to me by Tuesday, um, I will film you a loom and provide some more personalized feedback and then send it back to you. And then, yeah, my email is there. And then I think it's also in some of the uh, toolkit documents. And I think, perfect, Jordan, just put it in the chat as well. Um, yeah, so then just as a reminder, if you haven't already checked out the Find Your Seafood to uh, Week toolkit, please do that. Um, and then, there, like I said, there's a Loom video in there to walk you through it. Um, and then if you get started on any of that stuff over the next week and you want feedback, you can email that to me. Um, but yeah, now we can uh, take some questions and practice what I'm preaching with a dynamic two-way conversation. Thanks, Emily. I will just say, I know we, we have a few questions that popped up in the chat. Um, but I would also encourage you guys to use the raise hand function. Um, and again, this can be more of a discussion and informal. So hopefully if you guys are comfortable, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. But until then, I will go ahead and uh, share a question, question that we got in the chat. So uh, Aja asks, how long did you ask questions to your audience before starting to get regular responses? So Emily, you had mentioned, you know, using some tools in the stories to build out your content. Uh, how consistent do people need to be? Yeah, so I think if you're not getting a lot of responses back from your audience, so I would play with the different stickers. So I know sometimes if I put up a question sticker where people have to actually, you know, like type in a question, those ones tend to get less of a response. Whereas I have a if I have a poll sticker up that sort of provides them with options, I find those tend to get a little bit of a higher response. I think it's maybe less thinking for people. They don't have to like come up with a whole question off the top of their head. Um, so if you provide them with some different options, for example, like what would you like to see this Find Your Seafood Week and give them like three or four options about like, you know, recipes or sustainability info and like let them choose, um, that might be a better way to increase engagement. Another thing you can do is that, you know, the one or two people who are responding, I would follow up with them in DMs um, because clearly they are engaged with your content and they might be, they might have more ideas. They might be more open to a conversation if they are responding to your stickers. Um, so I would lean into the people who are already engaging with your content and just send them a quick message in the DMs and say, hey, this was a really great, great question. Thank you for your feedback. Um, do you have any other ideas or do you mind if I run something past you? Um, I think, you know, if they're following you and then you reach out to them, they'll be they'll be really happy. And again, it'll just help to like build that personal connection. Thank you. That's a great question. And Adria, I know you had a couple other questions. I'll just invite you to unmute and- Yeah, sorry. I was just rapid firing them into the chat. Oh, it's great. Um, it's great. Okay. So do you use a platform like Hootsuite or something newer um, to share the same content? I'm just like overwhelmed with the number of platforms to post yeah. on and like do you do one each day of the week like what's the best way to tackle that mm -hmm. yeah so I use buffer which is really similar to Hootsuite it's another scheduling platform um, and I will typically schedule my Facebook LinkedIn and then sometimes Twitter posts um, I find those are just like the easiest for me scheduling wise the only reason I don't use it for Instagram and TikTok, well, I actually don't think there's a platform for scheduling on TikTok right now. Um, and then I don't use it for Instagram because I am normally posting video content and I, I personally just like don't trust the <laughs> scheduling platforms with video content. I've just like had some hiccups. 
Um, but I've used Buffer or like scheduling platforms to schedule um, like in feed posts. I've used it for, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And I highly recommend it um, because if you try to post, yeah, like you said, there's a ton of platforms. If you try to post on every single one on like you're going to spend hours every day on your phone and nobody wants to do that. So what I normally do is I will take like a few hours on like a Sunday, I'll schedule everything and anything that I don't schedule, um, I'll still like write the captions out for, and then I'll just like put a reminder on my phone to be like, oh, post this Instagram reel. Oh, okay. The captions already there. Copy, paste it good to go. And then like every single day, you don't have to worry about it. Okay. And then do you just save the real draft in advance? Yeah. Then- so I, um, I would recommend saving it though, like to your, um, like your photos on your iPhone, not in Instagram. Um, just because if you save the draft in Instagram and then for some reason you get like you log out or something or Instagram doesn't update, you can lose your drafts. Um, so like most of the time it's okay. Um, but just like, I know people who have stockpiled like 50 drafts on Instagram and then had them all get deleted. So yeah, if you can, I, um, I use CapCut, uh, which I can type it in the chat as well. Um, and it's free video editor for iPhone and it's super easy to use. And so I edit all of my reels and TikToks in that. And then I save them right onto my iPhone. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And um, sorry, can I ask a few more? I don't want to take up all the time. Do, should we bop around to some other people and then come back? Because I have more questions. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, maybe Adria, we can uh, take a few questions from other people and come back to you if that's okay. Sounds good. Hello, Emily. This is Les Brown. Hi. And Paloma, it's nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you if you had kind of a critical path of someone who is just starting this for the first time, and there's all these options that they can do, would you would you give uh, would you have any advice of the, like the top three things that you would do to get started? Uh, as far as choosing which platform to, to go on or anything like that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, great question. I know starting from scratch can be, yeah, uh, yeah, trying to figure it out in the dark. I totally get it. Um, so I would think about if you already have a customer base, like think about that demographic. So uh, like generally speaking, there's like certain demographics that are on different platforms for, so like older demographics tend to utilize Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, a little bit more. TikTok is where you're definitely going to find like the Gen Z audience. Instagram, I find is a good mixture. Like I would recommend Instagram to most businesses, unless you're doing strictly B2B, um, then I would say don't bother with Instagram. But if you are doing like B2C, which I think most people likely are on this call. Um, I think Instagram is a great platform just because it's visual um, and people are so visual, whereas things like um, LinkedIn and Twitter can be a little bit more challenging. But I think Instagram is definitely one to have for sure. I think Facebook is another good one to start out with. I think Facebook has some more features in terms of like how to actually engage with businesses that other platforms don't have. Um, And I would say like you don't have to be on every platform. Um, Like I personally have an account on every platform. So there's a presence, but I really only utilize Instagram, TikTok, and then maybe Twitter. But like um, I was just mentioning, I mostly automate or schedule things on Facebook and LinkedIn. So the only ones that I'm really like on on are Instagram and TikTok. Um, So be wary of like spreading yourself too thin too. Cause if you start, you know, six different accounts on six or six different platforms, um, then it'll be harder to amass an audience on each one. So I would say focus on like two to start Facebook. I think an Instagram would be a good starting point. Um, and then sort of trial and error. If you, and if you see that it's not gaining the traction that you thought, um, then maybe jump over to another platform and see if you have success there. Starting out is always a bit like, ironing out some kinks, figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, But that would be my biggest thing is don't open an account on every single platform right off the bat. Start with two. It's more manageable. Um, Yeah. And then focus on building up those two before you sort of branch out. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. 
Stephanie, I see your hand, but I also don't want us to forget Jenna's question from the chat. Jenna, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, hi, Emily. Um, hi. My question is basically, how long can you stick with one message? Um, do you have any tips on how to not bore your audience? Yeah, I think you can stick with one message forever. Um, I mean, I like, I think if that, like your why is your why, right? Like you're not going to have a million reasons for doing what you do. Um, I've told my why story probably a thousand times, um, by this point. And it's part of my, it's part of my identity, like as a business and as a person. Um, so I think like, I know I see your comment here, like your, your message is to encourage uh, people in Washington to eat locally harvest and process seafood. So I would like think deeper, like why, why do you want people in Washington to eat locally harvested and processed seafood? Why, like, why is it important to you that people eat locally and processed seafood? Um, and dig deeper. There's like a, Simon Sinek also has like this thing where he, it's called the seven whys. So, you know, when you're like talking to a kid and you're like, no, you can't have that. Well, why? Because I said so. Why? You know, like, so he, he encourages you to like actually think through um, in your own head, like, okay, so you want people in Washington to eat locally harvested and processed seafood. Why? Because you're supporting the local economy and local fishermen. Okay. Why is that important? Why should I care about that? You know, because, and then like ask yourself why seven times. Um, and that might help you build out that why story. So you don't feel like you're sort of, um, repeating the same thing over and over again. That's fantastic, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. Stephanie, do you wanna unmute? Yeah, um, hey Emily, thanks so much for this presentation, it was really great. Um, I actually just, I have a question about hashtags. Um, I had a little bit of problem with my speaker, so I don't, didn't hear anything talk about hashtags. Could you just kind of talk about that? I've heard before, like if you add too many, it kind of like cancels them out or something. Um, also just a quick comment. I sent you an email not too long ago when your first, this first email came out about seafood travel. So if uh, I'll, I'll resend it, I'll con connect with you again. I love your webpage too. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, I appreciate it. I have your email flagged, Paloma and I were just uh, talking about it. Actually, I, uh, yes, I've been so busy preparing for this, but it's on my radar. Um, but yeah, so for hashtags are, you're totally right. Um, Instagram changes its mind about hashtags every other day. Um, so I'm almost even like hesitant to go too deep into it. But so right now I believe the cap for hashtags is 30. Um, but yeah, Instagram is now saying that even though we give you 30 hashtags, if you use 30 hashtags, we're not going to post your, we're not going to push your content up. Um, so honestly, and this goes back to what I was just saying with trial and error, you might just have to play around with it a little bit. Right now, what I found personally for my content, the sweet spot, it's like five to 10. Um, so I've been using five to 10 hashtags in my content. Um, and I recommend like a mix of hashtags. So I've done like really in-depth hashtag research in the past uh, where I've actually like, you know, thought of words that are related to my business and then gone to Instagram to see like what type of content is posted under those hashtags, how many pieces of content there are. Um, Cause I recommend posting, if you only use very general hashtags, like hashtag seafood or has hashtag fish, there's gonna be tens of millions of photos under those hashtags under those hashtags and your photo is never like it's just gonna fall right to the bottom as soon as you post it so what i recommend normally is having like a good mix of like having like one or two hashtags that have a few million photos and then have one or two hashtags that maybe have like 10,000, 20,000 photos, and then have one or two hashtags that maybe have like a few hundred photos. So, I mean, the find your seafood week hashtag is a great example um, because it's one of the ones that, you know, the content is very specific. It's very niche. Um, people will easily be able to find you. So I definitely recommend using that one. Um, and then other hashtags, just like trying to, yeah, again, it's a bit time consuming. So, and it's a bit in the weeds, but if you have time to look at the hashtags, I recommend a good balance of like since I think five to 10 is working right now, I would maybe do like three that are in the million, um, maybe three that are in like 10,000 to 20,000, and then three that are under a thousand um, and play with that for a few days and see how it goes. And then if you find it's not working at all, you can try something else, try more, try less, try different hashtags. Um, 
Then the other thing I would say is also experiment with your hashtags in the caption or in the comments. Um, so I sometimes put, I put key hashtags usually in the, uh, in the caption of the photo. So things like hashtag find your seafood week. Um, if I'm working with a brand and they have a brand hashtag, like I normally put that right in the caption and then secondary things I'll put as like a comment and then put hashtags in the comments, um, just to like, give it like a cleaner look. I'm sure you've seen on Instagram. Like if people have a ton of captions or hashtags in the caption, it can look a bit messy. Um, but yeah, I would play around with it and see what works and what doesn't. I know it's like not a very good answer, but <laughs> social media is so hit or miss that sometimes you just have to play with it and see what happens. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, also, I had another question about like Linktree and how to like, is, I don't, I don't have TikTok, so I don't know, but I know Instagram, you can do the Linktree and I have that. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend that and putting it in the caption link in bio, like a lot of people do? Yeah, definitely. Um, that is, that's a good call to action. Um, so like I do that if I'm posting about like a blog post or like I post something and I'm like, if you want to learn more about X, head to the link in bio to find my latest blog post or something like that. Um, if you are using Linktree though, I would also just recommend like specifying what the link is called. Like if you're sending them to a specific thing, um, that's even something that I have to like remind myself to do because if you have a Linktree, there's usually like a handful of different links. So if you just say, go to the link in my bio and then they see six different links, you're gonna be like, well, which one is it? So just make sure like you tell them what it's called. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for the questions. I want to chime in really quickly. <laughs> I am not a I'm not a social media expert, and unfortunately, I don't have very many videos to share through the local catch network. Um, but alongside maybe like hashtags, is like videos tend to have a much larger reach. I feel like that yeah. the algorithm um, is really uh, kind of being catered towards videos. So people that would not normally see your content who aren't following you are way more likely to see your videos than they are your posts. So like mm -hmm. those hashtags are really a really great way to reach a broader audience if you're using video. I feel like um, it's not as seen if you're doing it with just like a, a picture post. Um, so I think that's just like another case for, for thinking about trying to incorporate um, reels um, into your Instagram and TikTok. Um, if you use TikTok. Yeah, definitely. Video, yeah. video is king. <laughs> yeah, Emily, this is less one more question. So mm -hmm. wh where does the website come in on all this? <laughs> so, you know, everybody went to the website for 20 years. You know, <laughs> this, this, this conversation is about social media. I understand that. Mm -hmm. What's the link between those two? Do you try with your social media to drive people to your website or it, or is this an evolving thing that that the website's going to have less importance? Uh, anyway, uh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think the opposite, actually. So I am super, super adamant about making sure that anything I post on social media also goes on my website. Um, okay. So the nature, I mean, the nature of my website is a bit different, I think, than if you have like a storefront. I have like a blog that the content updates more regularly. Um, but I, so for me, I think websites are incredibly important now more than ever, because if Instagram or TikTok decides tomorrow to shut down, all of your content is gone. You don't own any of the content that you post on social media. And I know that sounds very dramatic, um, but it's true. Like whatever you post on social media, it's gone if they close it. Um, and so like, I always recommend that, you know, you try to also repurpose that. If you have a blog section of your website, like utilize it or maybe this is a good reason if you have capacity to start one um and then like we were just talking about with stephanie like constantly driving people to your website i think is really important so that's what i i use social media is to drive people to my website or more importantly to drive people to my email list um so i don't i don't know if everybody has an email list but that's another one that i would recommend having at least one of those either a website or an email list um because again those are really the only two pieces of content like the only two spaces rather on the internet that you own um, any social media platform you don't own the content that you put out there but you own your email list and you own your website um, so for me I, I use social media to drive people to those platforms where I actually 
own them um, so that I can just have ownership of the content. Um, but also like if you have a storefront on your website, the sort of call to action would be, you know, using social media to drive people to make a purchase through your website, um, to sign up for your email list. If you want to share updates, more frequent updates that way, if you prefer that than social media. Um, but yeah, so I use social media as a stepping stone to the website, if that makes sense. Thank you. That was a great question. Super important. Hey, Joyce, you, your hand is raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, Emily, would you mind sharing about the process behind your content calendar and how you build that out? And like, what do you use it from Excel or a program? Or is it the whiteboard that's behind you that I see? <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um, so I try to, so yeah, definitely planning your content is key. Actually, that's exactly what I was doing before I got on this call. Um, I can show you, actually. Um, so I, the the planner that we've included in the toolkit is kind of, it's really similar actually to the way that I plan my content. I use a different platform, but all of the sort of like blanks that we have you fill in are pretty similar. Uh, so I think everyone can see this now. Um, so this is like a calendar view, um, exclude info, don't tell anybody, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but so this is like what the back end of my content looks like. Um, so for example, like I posted this piece of content today. Um, so these are the things that I like have in my content that are similar to the content calendar. Mine's a bit more like technical, but each piece of content opens up. It has like a section to choose which channel it's going on, which we also have in the content calendar. So you can choose which channel. Um, so I actually have mine linked to campaigns. So I know this is for Find Your Seafood Week, um, which is helpful for me. I have content pillars that are relevant to my brand. So I can select one here. Um, I also have priority. And then um, again, like this is kind of really in the weeds. I, I don't know if this is helpful or more confusing, um, but then I have um, so the publishing date, whether it's been published, like the status goes here. And then I have these areas like filming dates. So some of my content that I like film in my office, I will put the date here so that I have a separate calendar for filming. Um, if I have research, it usually goes in here. And then I put um, if things need a script, if they need graphics, if they need to be edited, filmed, if I need to do a voiceover. Um, so this is, as you can see, like it's really tailored for video content. And then literally, like I was saying, copy and paste the caption like this was in here three days ago. So today the notification went on my phone to post this today. I copied and pasted and all the guesswork was out of it. Um, yeah. And this is like pretty much what I do. I yeah, see, I have my find your seafood week caption in here too. not started TikTok reels, um, the hashtags that are relevant to it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answered your question to show. That no, that's or, super or helpful. <laughs> what platform is that? Um, this is Notion. So yes, this is my baby. Uh, everything is in Notion. You can like see things differently. Blogs, filming calendar. Um, it's, yeah, it's definitely, it's a very like not user-friendly platform at all. I actually, I have somebody who manages it for me. Um, but it's super handy uh, for like project management and managing my content calendar. But if you're interested in like organization, I highly recommend it. Okay, thank you for the walkthrough on yeah, that. No. I'm not really familiar with like the back end of the platforms and I've seen Excels and I just need like something to get organized. Yeah, and I think like, um, so like I said too, like if you, the we so we have the content planner in Excel um, if you like, if you prefer something else like Notion, for example, you can go Google, sorry, like Notion content calendars and see if you like that better or Google, like you can Google whatever platform content calendar and play around with it. Um, and like I said, like, I'm happy to provide feedback. So if you do like do one, whether it's in sheets, whether it's in Notion, whether it's in another platform, I can look it over and kind of say like, oh, maybe you should think about this, or maybe this is missing, um, yeah, because I've like I've been doing it for seven years now. So um I I think I've learned a thing or two, but <laughs> yeah, I can help sort of take away some of some of the stress because I know it can be um content planning can be exciting, but also pretty overwhelming. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for the questions. 
I'm just looking through the comments here. Oh yes, yeah, Stephanie made a, a great point. Canva also has a content calendar option. Um, so, cause if you're editing the Canva graphics, you'll already be in Canva. So that's super handy. Cause then you can just link them. Um, Abigail, do you tend to use some standard hashtags in every post? Um, yeah, so I normally like, for me, I, I um, always hashtag like sustainable seafood just because that's relevant to my content. Um, and that's a hashtag that I follow as well. Um, when I'm posting about uh, travel experiences related to seafood, I have I have basically like two hashtag groups, um, which is just like a group of 10 hashtags for a certain content, 10 hashtags I have for like fishery science, sustainable seafood content, and then I have 10 hashtags for travel content. Um, and then I tend to use the same 10 for those types of content. But again, that changes all the time. Um, I found that those 10 work after a lot of trial and error. Um, and then when they stop working, I'll go back to the drawing board and then start all over. <laughs> all right, it looks like we are coming up here on time. And I, Emily, is it okay if there are any like last minute questions that yeah, people course. to throw out? Okay, any last minute questions in the group? Adria, I, I did see you ask about like a, the light, one of the oh, yeah. lights. I was um the the one I have is from Amazon. I believe the brand is called oops, whoopsie called UBZ. Um, and I have two from them. I have like a big one, and then I have a smaller one, and they have like um like a remote, so you can do selfie mode. Um, I'll send you. I'll pop a link. Oh, this is amazon.ca though. So the Americans will have to find this on the US website, but yeah, it's called UBZ. Uh, they're super affordable and yeah, I've been using them forever. They're not fancy at all, but they work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, everybody, I think we're going to wrap it up for the day. Thank you, Emily, so much for sharing all this awesome information <laughs> um, and for offering to provide kind of like that one-on-one -on -one feedback for people for Find Your Seafood Week. Um, we will send out a list of the tools that were shared today, including the toolkit and the uh, Loom video and a few other things that were mentioned. Um, and we really are hopeful that you all will participate and find your seafood week. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help support and amplify your messages, please let us know. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to kind of continuing uh, this conversation at a later date and seeing what you guys put together for find your seafood week. So thank you all. Thank you.